Native commands like kubectl, docker, or even netsh, these are incredible commands and they empower you to work with amazing technologies, but they can get pretty complicated. That's why we're thinking about a new way to take native commands and make them more PowerShell like, make them more like commandlets. I sat down with Jim Truer, one of the first members of the PowerShell team to talk about a new way to work with native commands. This is a long video, but one that I hope you'll watch from beginning to end, just in case I put in some time codes into the show notes so you can quickly jump to the areas that you're interested in. What we're gonna focus on is a demonstration of Jim's prototype with kubectl, so you can see kind of what we're talking about. Then we're gonna dive into Jim's explorations, and this is from his blog post that also there's a link in. And those explorations are how he's doing what the magic is that you see. So we're gonna show you some code as well and how he's getting there. And of course, we're looking for your feedback and giving us ideas and telling us what we're doing right and what you think we might be doing wrong. I started the interview by asking Jim, who are you? Welcome to the show. I'm a musician that found his way into high tech, taught music for seven years. And then I got into high tech, uh, cause it was better money. Um, and that's what really happened. And I had met a guy and he said, Hey, I've got a job for you. Come and work for me. I said, okay. Uh, I almost didn't get that job. They wanted somebody that had uh, more higher qualifications. The job was to stick floppy disks into a computer and run a program. That was the job. So they wanted somebody that had a lot of skill to do that. Had some great mentorship along the way that helped me learn how to program sensibly and, and things to think about. And then I went um, and I started doing more engineering. Then I was an engineering manager for Sun uh, in the early in 90, 91 92 then i went to a high uh, a startup in uh, in san jose uh, was a partnership of unix systems laboratory and novell where i worked on a product called unixware until uh, novell bought usl and that kind of ended the the merger so i found uh, i started doing some consulting i consulted for the mips organization so i was working at silicon graphics working with pyramid and Concurrent and NEC and Sony and all those guys that were all using MIPS chips in uh, in the mid 90s. And then I went to a company called Software Systems, another startup, um, and worked on a product called, uh, uh, at the time it was called OpenNT, uh, which yeah. was really uh, in uh, the Interix product. Uh, Interix product yeah. was the implementation of Unix on Windows. And Microsoft uh, acquired uh, the technology and some of the staff, and that's how I wound up at Microsoft in 99. Uh, and then in 99, I was still working on the Interix product. And then uh, I had the opportunity to work on the, the at the time, it was called the Monad project. And uh, I was a PM, the, one of the first PMs that was hired on that project. I had a lot of at the uh, Perl experience and I had lots of Unix shell experience. And so, uh, and we knew about, we knew that we were going to use C sharp as our platform. So I had learned a lot about C sharp at the time. And that's the re reason why PowerShell looks like it does. It works, looks a lot like it does because we started with uh, the Unix shell, predominant Unix shell, which was, you know, the bash shell. Uh, the POSIX shell actually is what we kind of started with, with some uh, incorporated some bits of Perl and we incorporated a lot of C sharp into it. And so we created the whole syntax kind of out of whole cloth. It was a, it was a dicey proposition. There was, but there was really no real good solution. We needed a new language to express the things we needed to express. We looked at using other languages, uh, but all of them aren't really weren't really shell like we wanted to make sure that it was an inter a good interactive experience and that was really the problem with the windows platform at the time if you think about it in 2001 or so or 2002 there wasn't a lot of command line tools and the only way that you could actually 
interact with the system on a command line basis was to use command.exe, which was kind of lacking from a syntactical perspective. It, you had to really stand on your head to, to be expressive with command.exe. So we were we kind of like, um, we wanted to be sure that we had a very expressive language to express the sort of things that we wanted to express. So it looks very much like uh, uh, the, the Born shell shells and their language they find their own level they find they are used for what you can use them for the more expressive they are the more you, things you can use them for and i wanted to be sure that ours was expressive enough to uh, fit into that sort of paradigm of, of interoperating with a with a machine i wanted to be sure that the command line was expressive enough which is why we have such a the language that we have and why it it's shaped the way we have and why we don't require uh, semicolons as, as statement separators and we don't require a whole you know a whole host of things because none of those things make any sense you know why don't you just make it c sharp and the response is is that copy open paren quote string close quote comma quote string close quote close paren semicolon doesn't make any sense from a command line what you really want to do is type copy file one file two Well, after we released version 1.0, we decided uh, uh, that we needed, we, we, we knew we weren't done because we, we didn't even have remoting in it at the time. So I started working on making sure the remoting stuff was, uh, was uh, going to start happening. But at the same time, we wound up getting into Windows and another project popped up in Microsoft that I was personally very familiar with and personally very interested in. And that's how I got into the PowerShell team and then then back out of the PowerShell team. Yes, but then you came back, which is. <laughs> and then I came back. I thought I thought that the power I thought I thought that I had still something that I could offer PowerShell. Um, this is a Jupyter notebook. This conversation and all of our demonstrations are going to be in this Jupyter notebook that I'm going to share out. And yes, there will be a link in the show notes on where you can get this notebook. And here's why I'm doing things in a Jupyter notebook. What a great way to have a conversation because not only can I go in here and say, hey, look, here's all the things you need to get started. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but you can execute the demonstration code exactly as we are here. In other words, you can click on one of these uh, buttons and it will execute the code. I've got some links in here for you that you're gonna need. Now, some of the code that we're gonna be working with is a module that Jim's been working on and so I wanted you to be able to get a link to his blog that also uh, will point to this module. Now, this blog goes into detail with code examples of Jim's thinking process as he's been working on these native commands. The problem statement that you and I have been, been talking about now for a while has been there's a, and I love to use this word, so I'm just going to throw this word out, plethora of native commands. And what we mean by native commands are commands that aren't PowerShell that, that are born to run on that particular operating system. And today with new technologies like Docker and Kubernetes, and since we're focused on Kubernetes, I'll, I'll just use Kubernetes as an example. These native commands, they're not just simple copy commands. These are very rich, very uh, complex commands. And oftentimes they're very good commands, but they don't work like PowerShell. And because of that, while the commands themselves are excellent and they're great for experts for those technologies, if you're a PowerShell user, you end up spending an awful lot of time trying to figure out how those commands work before you can even get moving along solving your problem. We knew that there are a host of native commands that run on whatever platform you're on. And since I came from a more Unix background, the shell was simple glue for the commands that you would run. They they actually created a whole host of little commands to manipulate the data that you got out of those native commands. But we knew, or at least I did, <clears throat> that those native commands would never go away. They can't. They're 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 the the. That's why they're native. They're they're <laughs> part of the platform. They aren't going to go away. They shouldn't go away. And if you have a, a shell, if you're going to talk about a shell, then what you want that shell to do is to be able to execute those commands 
in the same way that it executes built-in commands? Is there a way to make it easier for, for users to do this? Do they have to do their own parsing? Can they? Can we make life easier for people to just incorporate these uh, native utilities fully into the PowerShell environment? Okay, just so that everybody knows, I'm working uh, in our current latest preview release of 7.1, and I'm working on preview three. Um, I'm gonna do a get module list available just so that you can see that I've already downloaded Jim's module from the notes at the very beginning of that Jupyter Notebook. So I have his module, and one of the things that you're gonna need to do to be able to get these commands is you're going to have to import the module. Now, I want you to notice I'm also using, uh, in this version of PowerShell, I'm running our predictive IntelliSense. It's helping me complete these commands a little quicker. So I'm going to import that module. Now, when that module is imported, I have full access to your work, Jim, uh, <laughs> that you've done so far. But before I dive into that, let me just run kubectl. And the reason that I'm running kubectl is to kind of show the point, this is an excellent command. It's a complex command. And when you run it for the first time or every time that you run kubectl, it's gonna start off by giving you help because if that's all you ran, you probably don't know what you want or what you wanna do. So now you can start going through the help. That's very useful, but that's not what I expect though, right? When I'm I'm working with PowerShell, kind of when, when I wanna start to look at things, I usually start with the git commands and I'll start with the noun like git cube, and then I'll start hitting the tab key. Look at all of this. The first kind of experiment that I was doing <clears throat> was uh, Kubernetes has a whole host of resources that are available to you. And, and a number of those you either have to create or there's a number of them that are available on the system out of the box. And what I wanted to do with kind of the first experiment is how could I take a look at the uh, resources available on in the Kubernetes environment and then convert those automatically into a more PowerShell uh, look and feel. If you're a PowerShell user, you already know you can grab that module and also get a list of all of the available commands uh, by just running that command of get command module and specifying the module. Again, another way to see all of what's available in this module. I'm gonna clear my screen again, okay, it's more comfortable for a guy like me to run this in a PowerShell universe as opposed to maybe working with those native commands. I was running kubectl, and one of the first things I wanted to do is I wanted to get a list of all of the current pods that were out there. And it doesn't even matter if I know what a pod is, I just wanted to get the list. Now, poking around, I finally figured out that I could type get pods, and I could strike enter, but nothing showed up. Now, it, when I was poking around, I realized that, but there are pods here. There, there are some system pods, at least if nothing else. And I eventually found that if I typed get pods and I used uh, syntax, and I, I wasn't really comfortable with this syntax coming from PowerShell. Now, my Linux skills say, yeah, this makes sense to me, dash, dash, all namespace. So that'll give me all namespaces that the pods might reside in. Oh, oh, and I do get a list. But see, when I downloaded your module, my brain was going, this isn't comfortable for me. What I really wanted to type was get cube. And I wonder if there's, there is, there's a get cube pod that you had in your module. And it was pod, not pods, plural, which made me super happy because I'm used to the singulars. That shows me what, as a PowerShell user, I would have expect. So you basically with this command are showing me everything that exists, not just a refined view when I start out. I found when I was learning Kubernetes as well that in order for me to get all the pods, I always had to use the minus all namespaces. Generally in PowerShell, more data coming back is kind of more useful. I can always call or uh, uh, um, select the data that I want, reduce the data set. But by default, I wanted to have an experience where you didn't have to always be using the same, uh, the, the all parameter, uh, all namespaces parameter all the time. Uh, some, some resources in Kubernetes, of course, don't have a namespace. But I wanted to be sure that when there was a namespace option that it was always being used 
That is to say, I was returning all the data that I could where then I could filter it after I retrieved it. And, you know, what's what's really interesting at this point, you know, in my brain, I started going, well, there's got to be a better way. But if I want to see specific namespaces, how would I do that with kubectl? So I looked it up. I, I poked around and found it. Um, and you, and, and it, I've, I've already done all namespaces. But what if I wanted to see a specific namespace? And in this case, um, I have this in the notebook as an example. Dash n and uh, cube system will give me just those system ones. But I was thinking in my head, if I was doing this in PowerShell and I just wanted the cube system namespaces, isn't it more likely that what I would do is something like cube uh, pod and uh, uh, and that I already know that you're going to give me all of the pods that are out there and I'm going to pipe that to, uh, let's say, where? And I'm using my predictive IntelliSense to complete this really fast so I don't have to keep making spelling mistakes. But it's, it's, it, I'm just using where object here, where namespace equals cube system. Now, an experienced PowerShell user is going to say, OK, how did you know that namespace existed? Well, again, an experienced PowerShell user is going to know. And this is back to your point is, if I want to know what I can sort on or what I can filter on, I can I can say these are objects. I can send it to get member and it'll tell me what's available. And in this case, um, if I look down through here, I see namespace and it's a property. So I know I can use where object. I know I could use sort. I could I can filter on it. And in this case, get cube pod and uh, where cube system. This makes sense to me. Now I'm getting just the things from Cube System, and I've done it in a very PowerShell way that made sense to me. And I didn't have to go to the internet to look this up. So this is where or having it as objects really starts to benefit me in the PowerShell ecosystem. That's that's right. And and you'll also notice uh, that I've changed the output just a little bit to better kind of fit what the power what I think PowerShell is good at. If you could rerun the kubectl command, that would be, that'd work. If you look at the age and start date, restarts, all the other fields are present. I'm adding the namespace uh, uh, as well, but you'll see that the, the, a, the start date actually gives you a date. That means that you can next filter on um, date time types of objects rather yeah. than trying to convert the age from 8D to eight days and giving you uh, an, uh, a, essentially converting it to a date and then trying uh, trying again. So I wanted to be sure that we were rendering the data a little bit more powershell -y, if you will, um, even though it's, it's the data is the same, it's the same content. I'm just presenting it in uh, a more filterable uh, way. You know, there was one other thing that I, I wanted to show you that I thought was really cool when I uh, had first sat down with with your module. I had I had, was I was fighting this, but what I really wanted to do is, as you started pointing out some of that data, you might want to filter that on or sort some of that data based upon its restarts or uh, you know the time that it started, the date time information. That's what I wanted to do. So I finally found you know if I type in, well I had to look this up and figure this out. So I'm just going to accept it here. Sort by, and I know it's kind of tough to read on my screen. Uh, I'm going to highlight it so you can see it. But I finally figured out that if I go sort by equals, and it took me a while to get this to work. I just wanted to sort by restart count. My brain was not understanding what I had just typed in order to get um, the, a list of resources. In this case, it didn't find any because I didn't have any restarts. I may not have any restarts. But this was not a pretty way for me to think about it. So I started doing this and get cube just to kind of emphasize um what we're doing i used what i'm so familiar with the infamous sort object and i'm just grabbing the property restarts which again i used get member i saw that it was a property that was available i wanted it descending this took me i don't know three seconds when i originally wanted to try it i did like three seconds to type it in to see if it would work and it worked right it, it worked exactly the way that i wanted the idea behind native commands, you can run these native commands naturally as they are intended, but by bringing them into PowerShell, it accelerates everybody's adoption of these commands, which means it could even be easier for people to quicker adopt things like Kubernetes or adopt 
Docker faster because they don't have to spend so much time trying to figure out all those commands. That's that's right. And that was kind of the reason, the reasoning behind why I did it. I was trying to learn Kubernetes and I wanted to have a comfortable working environment. I know I need to understand these commands for sure, but I still needed, but I still wanted to have some sort of uh, accelerator so I could make it easier on me so I wouldn't need to remember that I always have to use minus all namespaces all the time. Just that's a, that's a small thing, but still, I thought that if I had the same problem, then I ex expected that uh, anybody that's trying to use this is probably going to have the same problem. I want to talk about re-implementation and API wrapping, some of the benefits and some of the issues as we get into why you were thinking about this differently. So explain to me a little bit about this first one, re-implementation, some of the benefits and some of the issues with basically you starting all over and doing this in a script or in managed code. Well, the first thing about re-implementation is that in order for you to re-implement something, you really have to be expert in the tool itself. So you know how to re-implement, so you know what to re-implement. The challenge is is pretty substantial. If you think about, you know, from me, my perspective, I certainly didn't want to have to re-implement the Kube Control application because first and foremost, I'm still learning Kubernetes, and and second, it's a very complex tool. So there's a lot of things that I could do. Perhaps I could implement one aspect of one small part of it. Maybe I could re-implement the kube control get pods command uh, but if you look at the kubernetes environment there are dozens and dozens of actual commands that it supports with the kubectl command so that that's that's kind of uh that, that's kind of the big hurdles that you have to to approach on the on the plus side the re-implementation means that it's natively expressing powershell concepts it's, everything's an object everything is uh is uh, uh, kind of m more in tune with how PowerShell works. The, however, the, the the minuses I think in this particular case f far outweigh the the positives. It's I have to be expert. I have to write a lot of code. Uh, I have to know what the uh, the what was on the minds of the guy who implemented the kubectl command, I have to do all of that. And and so re-implementation is probably okay for something small, but anything of substance is going to be quite difficult. So first and foremost, a lot of these things that you want to do are being surfaced as web uh, APIs. That is to say, you, you communicate with a web server, and in fact, Kubernetes does that very thing. Uh, you interface with the web service and you make an API call to that web service and that web service gives you a response to that API and you can use that data. It's usually packaged up as uh, some serialized object. JSON is the, the, the repackaging of du jour, if you will. Um, but again, the issue with approaching this from an API perspective is that it's a developer experience. The developer decided to make a set of programming interfaces available. It's done over uh, from a network, but there's still developer programming interfaces. Most applications, most applications that call programming interfaces have a lot of logic behind them that try to smooth out uh, the developer focused API usage to something that is more sensible for an administration perspective. So when you use REST APIs, you have to create a lot of essentially business logic to make those mm -hmm. the results of those APIs sensible to an administrator or to a user, especially if you start looking at things like Kubernetes the, the yeah. things you need to express, those APIs are going to need a lot of assistance uh, on the client side to kind of make sense of the, the response from the API. What you really want to type is get me the file list, kind of logically get child item and get a list of files. 
you don't necessarily want to have to worry about the anything else that you may want to do or filtering or or any of that uh, you just want to use it as a tool not as a developer exercise if you talk about historical uh, applications that aren't changing very very much then the native application wrapping kind of makes a can make a lot of sense it's it's you might not be able to express everything that the native application is is doing or you may not want to but it's pretty straightforward it's the reason why you know back in 2002 i write, wrote that wrapper for ip config but and ip config doesn't change that much but other applications other native applications may change more rapidly and it means that you kind of have to watch out for those uh for those changes and make sure that you are supporting those changes if you want to support that new executable for sure We're not going to look for a Swagger doc for this. We're not going to API wrap this. We're not going to write a script around this. And we've talked about that some of the reasons why this is, you know, there are benefits to it, makes it a little bit more PowerShell-y, but there's still a lot of work. And also, anytime that command changes, the native command changes, you got to go back and redo all of this work. So when I was looking at these complicated commands, the first thing that I was looking at is, all right, so this command actually has some very substantial help. Uh, I was wondering whether or not that help would be machine readable. That is to say, could I could I parse this output and take action based on the output? Uh, one of the things that would need to happen would be that the output would need to be consistent, invocation to invocation. So when I was looking at you know when I was looking at Kubernetes. Uh, as as kind of a test bed, I was I was very interested in determining whether or not the help output that was coming from Kubernetes would be consistent and and parsable enough by uh, uh, by a script. If you think about what that help looks like, I mean, I can I, let me share my screen. So if I run this command, you'll see that there is a whole host of output that it provides. And if you start looking at it, you'll see, oh, there's basic commands and there's intermediate commands and there's a bunch of commands. But if you'll notice the format, then it has a usage statement and has some oh, other yeah. information. So so when you start to look at this, they said, oh, the commands all have a kind of a shape to them. They say commands colon, in fact, in this particular case, except for this guy up here. So let's think about that for a second. Well, that's the first level of Kubernetes uh, uh, usage, but maybe uh, kubectl uh, uh, config. Oh, look, there's more that I can do here. Again, look at the when I looked at the format, I it looks a lot like a man page to me. So there's a bunch of things that I can actually kind of look for in the output and use to kind of build up commands here. So you can see that it gives me a usage. It says kubectl config subcommand, and if I look up at the subcommands, available commands up in the middle of the page, current context, get clusters, rename, set, all the rest of it. So I can let's take a look what happens here. Oh, now there's even more stuff. And not only is it telling me that this what thing what these what this command can do, it's also telling me how I can do it. So if you look here in the options, it says, oh, there's a parameter called set raw bytes equals false. Well, it looks like that could be a switch because uh, it's a Boolean. It's either false or true. It defaults to false. That means that in my mind, it's a switch. So I'm doing this conversion. I'm thinking, can I look at this and see if I can automatically read this data and convert oh, it to an object, which I can then turn into a commandlet. There's a number of these uh, of these commands that have this sort of assistance, that that have this sort of what appear to me to be uh, machine readable, if you will, uh, parsable uh, parsable uh, help that can be used to generate uh, commands. So that means that I can use uh, I can generate those commands and then and then uh, uh, present that as an interface for an administrator. So in this so, particular case, I chose Kubernetes. You could choose Docker or something else. 
So as I was looking at the output of Kubernetes, the, my first actual desire was to understand what resources were available. And Kube Control has the API resources uh, command uh, CTL API resources. And it provides you a table of the available resources that Kubernetes has uh, or can have. This output is not available as JSON. It is only available as text. So because I wanted to have, again, I want to take these objects and I want, I want to take this text and turn them into objects, I had a problem. I can't call it with JSON. I can't use kubectl to get uh, uh, JSON. So what I wound up doing was creating a, a very small framework that based on column titles, it would take the output and, and dissect each line based on where the column position was. So you tell it what columns are in the output and it will figure out what column those things start on and then capture the text in that cell, if you will, and create an object out of it. My problem was I wanted to turn this information into structured data so I could use where and I could filter and I could you know, query against namespaces and kinds and short names and all the rest of it. And so what I wound up doing was creating a very, very small tool which given a list of fields, if you take a look up here, given a list of fields, it will determine where in that text output those fields begin on the column and collect the data from column to column and create a piece of structured data out of it. So it's a kind of a simple, it's kind of a simple uh, a tool that allows me to easily convert whatever shape that that table is into some structured data. It takes that and builds me an object out of text. So this is very similar to the convert to the convert to object uh, commandlets that we have. I had to teach it a couple of extra things because some of the columns actually may have comma separated values, means that I need to create uh, an array with those things. Uh, for example, in this particular case, you don't see it here. And I'm not sure that you'll see it if I wrap it here, but if I ask for the wide format, you'll see that in this particular oh. case, mm -hmm. it has this verbs. It's hard to see in this uh, in this sort of shape, but yeah, as you can I see, can, yeah, I can see it over there. Yeah, as you can see, the verbs are have a format. They have this bracket close and, and with a space separated thing. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to convert that to a, a a list, and so every line that I read knows where the fields are. It divides it up into an uh, into its component parts and then creates an object out of it. Once I have that object, I can then create. I can all get all the list get verbs, if you will. Once I have all the get verbs, I can say, oh, these are the resources that I can retrieve. So I will auto generate the get dash kube resource from this object. So the first thing you need to do, you take the output in text, convert it to an object. Once I have an object, I find out which one of those things support get. Now that I have that list, I can now generate the commandlets that are getters. And now that I have that, I know how to call the command uh, in the wrapper. So I'm building up this object model that allows me to query the system and create these um, functions which call kubectl get pod or kubectl get config map or that sort of thing. So based because I've got the problem of multi text, I have to convert that to an object. Once I have an object, I can then find the gets. And once I have the gets, I can then construct command that's out of those. Here's the first set oh, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of the code that I wind up doing that. It turns out that it's not too too tricky because the the fields are regular and whatnot. So here's the place where I define the fields that I'm looking for. And here's where I determine the offsets. And I have created a, a, a 
an actual PowerShell class where it will take the line of text and the list of offsets, and then it will provide you a uh, object for each one of those things. So this is how uh, I'm actually converting this string to an object. And the code that you see here um, uh, on line 294 and line 300 is just a little bit of, of caching information that I wanted to do because I didn't really want to have to run kube control every time since resources don't really change that often, uh, although they can. And so I added a force to actually reforce the uh, uh, the uh, execution of the of the kube CTL and then return those resources. So uh, it, and you can see how I've done the filtering and all the rest of it. I'm doing the filtering on the client side again. I want to collect all of the data and then. And then send it, send it, send it filtered locally. It may be a little bit slower because I'm returning a lot more data, but that's something that I think that right. I can add later on. I can do client side uh, uh, filtering if I if I think that's a uh, if there's a reason to do so. It's possible to do. Kubernetes actually supports that. So you're looking at the code here that actually allows me to run this command, which is here, invoke kube control. There's no verb, I'm getting API resources, blah, blah, blah. These are the fields I want, calculate my offsets, hand that off to the constructor for the kube resource, and that way I can run if I import the module, of course. I can actually now say get kube resource. And there we have it. So you can see that I have converted these yeah. things into objects, and it's very clear. And when I generate when I generate the uh, command, that I'm actually using the kind uh, field rather than the name, which is why we have get kube. Oh, it doesn't have one. Let's do uh, let's get. I spell it right to be better. There we go. So now we can say get kube component. And you'll notice that the name of the command is get kube component. And there we have our components. It's the same. As it is with, yeah. It's the same. It was my exploration of where I wanted to go that led me to the second exploration, which was how can I parse the Kubernetes help to help me understand what parameters I need to build and how I can start to call this command. It's still in the experimental, um, you can see some of my un unfinished work here, but this is the, this is the parser that actually allows me to uh, uh, parse the the uh, the the tool a little bit, and it's still quite in flight. But this allows me to import uh, when I when I import this, I actually can. Uh, let's do this. Let's just import it. So there is a single function that that I called down way down here in the bottom here. Now you'll start to see. So what's happening here is this is the result of oh. looking at each one of the help functions for each one of the uh, Kubernetes commands that can be run. So it is parsing the help and determining what Kubernetes help I need to run. So it looks at the first help page, figures out what subcommands are available, and then calls the help on the subcommand. And then if that has subcommands, I then call the help, the get help on that subcommand. And it returns a big hairy object that I'm still kind of working with here. Um, 
where it's it provides a whole bunch of information. So if you look at this and if we look at kubectl, you'll find that it's actually capturing the description because the description seems to always be on the oh, top. Yeah. That's one of the things I'm relying on in the format of the help. If the help's on top, I will get it and I'll take care of it. But if we take a look at some of the subcommands, if we go back to here, there's a whole host of subcommands. Let's take a look at the first one. So here's a, uh, uh, and then we can look at the description, which is essentially, it's telling me, you can see the command elements. So it's kubectl create, select first five we'll just not we don't need to see everything yeah, yeah. Uh, do that so there we go oh sorry about that no i just need to minus help it's yeah. there we go so now we have so that and this are the same thing now if it has any options we can actually take a look or parameters here are the parameters now those parameters are have two things in them. They have the dis, well, they have a few things in them. They have the description, which is the text. I'll show you that in just a second. They have the name, and that's the parameter name that I'm going to present for PowerShell. And it has the oh, original. Better, okay. And it has the original parameter name. So I need to track that because when the user provides a parameter name to a commandlet, it's going to look like what a parameter is going to look like. But when I call kubectl, I need to remember what the original parameter is because that's what I have to have to use when I call kubectl. So when I'm calling kubectl create, I need to make sure that I'm using dash dash allow dash missing dash template dash keys. But when I have a commandlet, I want the parameter name to just be get or, or a, a new it's create, so it's going to be new kube. I'm not sure what it's going to be yet. I have to figure no, that out. Right. And then it'll be minus allow missing template keys. And, and then I can actually even further. So this allows me to kind of this. What, what you're seeing here is the sausage being made. This is how I'm going to create the, the parameter statement. And I'll have a. Um, um, uh, 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 a way to uh, actually have a two string that will actually generate a parameter block. And so I'll be able to start creating the pieces that will allow me to do, to allow me to uh, go through uh, and generate these, these proxy uh, commandlets. So this allows me to, you, you can see that I've got the usage statement. I've got uh, the, the parameters, I've got examples even. And so, my plan is my uh, my plan is to be able to let's just look at the first one. My plan is to be able to translate the command property into a PowerShell uh, example, so I can change this command where it says start a single instance of Nginx to invoke or start kube nginx and be right. able to generate that command and replace that so if you get help from the kube command from what i'm building as proxy commands you'll be able to see the powershell view i'll also provide if you want it the original view of what's going on so this even could be used as a tool for someone who wants to learn Kubernetes to find all the examples that they want. So if I wanted to for, uh, if I just wanted to all the examples of all the sub commands, I should be able to do that. So that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm, that's kind of where I'm headed. It's still a work in flight. Uh, there's still a lot to be done, uh, but, uh, but I, it seems very possible given that the Kubernetes or the kube control help is so regular and has all these sections that I can actually uh, learn and use. So basically, in the case of, of, of kubectl, 
let's say tomorrow they update the version, they add three parameters. What's going to happen to you? I mean, well, as, 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 as far as your module is concerned. So if if the if a, one of these commands adds a new parameter, any one of the commands, right now what you have to do is re-import the module. It will go and and regenerate the and run the get kube commands. It will regenerate all of the the objects that are being built out of the uh, built out of the uh, uh, help and regenerate all of those objects, which will then be used to regenerate the the command the proxy commandlets that I have. So even if they add an entire new category in a, an existing uh, in a, an existing set of subcommands, the system is clever enough to just read what it gets. And if you can call help on it, it'll call the help on it. So it won't have any more, uh, it'll be able to support that immediately because if, if new things are added. I had the same idea when I created in the first experiment, if someone adds a new resource, which you can do mm -hmm. very easily in Kubernetes, you add a new resource, all you really need to do is right now is re-import the module, we'll re-jigger, we'll re-run the API resources, determine what resources are available, recreate those uh, those uh, objects that are being used to generate the, 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 the commandlets, the little proxy functions, and those will be immediately available. I tested this a couple of weeks ago I created a couple of new resources that, uh, that, and it works just, it does, it does exactly what I expect it to. It reruns, relearns, and then recreates the, uh, the proxy commands that, that represent the new resource. Uh, at the top of this code, you'll see what I'm actually doing here is describing what usage looks like. So if usage changes, all you do is have to change it here. So I try to make it flexible to uh, to extensions, but it's not, it, uh, to be fair, it's not flexible to whole scale changes. So if chain, if the help changes dramatically and doesn't look the same way anymore, they decide to change that, then that would be problematic for this framework to do. What I want to kind of emphasize is that it's not our goal to build all of the all of the, the the commands out there that people give us a list about. What our goal is is to try to do testing to evolve that framework. That framework, we may send a couple of things out with it, but, but the, really that framework is there for other module owners to go. Hey, there is a native command. There's this framework. I can apply this. I can use this framework to help other people with this particular native command. In other words, we want the community to build a lot of these commands. That's why you're creating the framework. Correct. The The fact of the matter is, is that we can never have knowledge of all of the utilities that people use. We certainly can't build uh, these sorts of wrappers one by one for them. But what we would like to do is we would like to be sure that it is easy for people to take their own prop, their own local issues that they have with a particular utility they'd like to make it easier to deal with or they don't want to they need to help people learn it more more readily uh, we want to be able to kind of make accelerate that so by creating a framework that we think that we can apply to a large number of programs we can allow people to solve their problems more easily thanks for joining us for this episode of the show please make sure you give us your feedback and hey help someone <laughs>